This episode is sponsored by the Triple X alternative to Blockbusters, Crotchbusters. Yeah, man, talking about that dang old cuffs and collars, man. Like when they come over to clean that pool, man, and start going. Good sex is a lot like peeling an orange. First, you rip off all the skin and start gnawing on the juicy insides until you hit bone. Why do you think I look the way I do? Somebody had a big appetite. Just eat the damn oranges! Okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'll be serious for a second here, uh, if that's even possible with me. Uh, <laughs> so, this episode of King of the Hill shares a lot of thematic similarities to one of the greatest and most underrated movies of all time, 1997's The Game. Both follow a buttoned-down grump as he descends down a rabbit hole of strange sights, isolating conspiracies, and a world gone insane. Although sadly, none of the videos that Hank watches in this episode contains any sort of clowns, which is just terrible, unwatchable. Are you going to spend the rest of the evening prying at that clown's mouth? I, I, I don't. It's frustrating for me if you don't, if you don't pay attention. Plussy jokes aside, this episode has a very special factor working in its favor, one that is found in scores within the game, which you really gotta check out if you haven't seen it before. It's a brilliant film, but the name of that secret sauce is Escalation. One mishap spirals into another and another, each growing in scope and grimness until finally you've reached a crushing point of screaming madness where all you can do is just, just go to sleep. Go to sleep and try to trick yourself into believing all of this was just a bad dream. It's just a dream. But here's a little trick for all of you aspiring writers out there. You cannot start your story with the universe blowing up. What? That is far too much too soon, and it doesn't leave your story anywhere else to go. You really have to start off on a relatively normal note, one that establishes the regular functioning of the day-to-day -day sane world. Just get us into the humdrum of like, oh, normally this happens, and normally this happens, and then introduce the crazy X factor that messes it all up. And this episode really takes that idea to heart, presenting us with a Hank who is swaddled within an idyllic scene of suburbia, one where reality seems a little bit too similar to that Willie Nelson dream he had in the first season. <laughs> Let us call this our paradise moment, the state in which things are exactly how they should be. And not just for Hank, everybody here seems happy and fulfilled, even that orc in human clothes, Peggy. <sighs> but much like a white shirt at a dirt and red wine factory, nothing lasts forever. When Hank arrives home, he encounters the plot's catalyst, a disturbance that is so intolerable to live with, one so heinous that it sounds the horn of calamity. Hmm? <sighs> No! 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 These are my personal private undergarments. Now the whole neighborhood knows I wear them. That's right, people. Their dryer is broken. Ugh. Meaning all of the laundry has to be hung outside, which is a tricky business when you only really have one outfit, leading to some rather unfortunate clothing mishaps. Help me get the rest of these down. <laughs> Now, because this show rarely allows itself to get into a drunkenly absurd plot, our uncomfortable new normal is anchored by Bobby and his delightfully mundane B-plot with Luann. Oh, I thought I'd give them some time alone so they could, you know. What? You know, buy me a birthday present. Again, just like with the Budasak episode that came before it, this episode has Bobby being written with a frightening degree of authenticity. Kids will obsess over important dates looming on the calendar, and what is more important to a kid than their birthday? It's like, fuck yeah, dude, it's my day, it's my birthday, of course I'm gonna get pumped up for it, it's awesome! You know, even if it isn't for another month. Why would you bring a child to a department store to buy a dryer when his birthday is three and a half weeks away? It just doesn't make sense. They're watching me, trying to get into my head. This childish perspective gives Bobby the perfect filter to view his parents' eventual awkwardness and strange behavior, undercutting all of the scandalous shit with his dopey innocence. Bobby, do not get off the bus! Look at all those cards and gifts. This is gonna be the best birthday ever. But what really makes this B-plot shine is that Luann is also pulled into the gravity of Bobby's excitement. 
At first, she's just kind of like, um, no, Bobby, we're not here to get you a present, although maybe we would if you got rid of that yee-ass haircut. But as the episode goes on and more and more things start to look suspicious, Luann starts to believe that, hey, you know what, maybe Bobby's right. She even helps him practice his surprise reaction to the supposed surprise party, gleefully yelling surprise in a manner that just makes my heart explode with affection. And I know I'm not really being original with this thought here, as if that fucking matters, but the sound that Pamela Adlin makes as Bobby here is simply indescribable. No wonder she went on to win an Emmy for her performance as Bobby Hill. These noises are the height of human evolution, and they will echo through the ages long after we've all gone to pickup truck heaven. And best of all, this isn't the same recorded sound that's played twice, but two independently done sounds, meaning that she could probably do all kinds of fun variants of it. Truly, this is the magnum opus of voice acting. Let's all hail to the queen, because Pamela Adlin really just, ooh, she knocked it out of the park, and I don't think anything will ever match this sound. And one last note about this B-plot before we can move on, but I have to say that I think that the Bobby Luann dynamic is extremely underused throughout the series. Anytime these two interact is just, mmm, mmm, gold, gold, I say. <laughs> just wanted you to know that I never read your diary, even though you secretly suspected I did on June 18th, 1995. I was wrong to doubt you, Bobby. Okay, okay, though, that's enough of all the joyful stuff. It's time to dig deep into Hank's side of things. And where does it all go wrong? Well, just like in the Company Man episode, Hank is out here making a propane pitch to a character voiced by Billy West, which is weird that it happened twice and in the same season, no less. Isn't that so strange? A propane dryer costs a little more... Uh, only at first. When you factor in the lifetime cost of ownership, propane comes out on top. Let me run through the numbers. Okay, his interest in propane is starting to slide into an all-consuming obsession, and the worst kind of obsession, the sort where people will go like, um, actually, you're a little misinformed there, sir, in banal social situations, just like those fuckers who give unprovoked dinosaur facts at parties, or who will sneak in Star Trek references at inappropriate times. Ugh, those people are the worst. Anyway, once Hank has settled on a dryer, he is sweet-talked by his beloved siren into signing up for a credit card. No interest for six months and 10% off our first purchase. 10% off? Well, Chuck Mangione supports it and his diet shakes did okay by me. Can we just take a moment here to appreciate how good this show is at planting subtle little ideas and associations in our heads? I mean, look, we're at the Megalomart, so of course we're gonna mention Chuck Mangione and get a peek at Buckley going about his greeter job. Those ideas and images are merely in their larval state now, chilling in the soft meat of our brains. But someday soon, they will burst forth and bring us one of the most notable events in the entire series. Hello, America loves Megalomark. Okay, first of all, you can wipe that look off your face. But just as the Hills are about to purchase their much-needed dryer, we discover that Hank's credit is in the toilet and other avenues of payment have been cut off as well. I think I recognize a frowny face when I see one. Hank, why don't we just pay with a check? Uh, sorry, we can't take checks from people with bad credit. And because the Hills seemingly don't have access to a computer with the internet at their house, Hank goes to one of the least memorable characters ever, Melinda, and uses Strickland's computer system to look up his problem. Well, there's the right hair in your tuna. Seems like you're in the whole $40 to Arlen video. I really like that Strickland himself is becoming much more of a normalized side character. His brief pop in here feels very natural and much less like a Holy shit, ma, get in here, it's Buck Strickland, your favorite character, holy crap! kind of moment. But you know what is a holy crap moment? The indisputable fact that the guy at Arlen Video looks and sounds an awful lot like Mr. Van Dreysen from Beavis and Butthead. Hank Hill, June 23rd. Yeah, you rented and never returned cuffs and collars. Now, after school Monday, I'll set aside some time to discuss this with you, but until then, I'd appreciate it if you'd respect my privacy, okay? It's not quite a perfect match, but there are certainly some strong similarities. Now, because you're a really smart viewer who's also been watching a lot of my videos lately, you might expect me to go on this big tangent about the lost era of video stores. But when you see what kind of video Hank is accused of not returning, you'll see why I'm not exactly missing the video stores that much. Where would cuffs and collars be? 
Action adventure, action comedy, action action. Make a left. Okay. <laughs> That's right, Mr. Narrow Urethra himself supposedly rented Gasp, a porno, and this is why I'm glad that video stores have died. Because we have all doubtless had the same fantasy of reaching for a copy of Hellbound, Hellraiser 2, and touching hands with a cutie who was also trying to rent the tape, kicking off a whirlwind romance. The bitter reality is that renting porn in person comes with the risk of facing some particularly shameful encounters. Nancy tells me she ran into John Redcorn at the video store. The two of them heard you complain about some porno tape you lost. <laughs> oh man, the gall, the unrepentant gall of those two. Phew, snitching on Hank like that. They know they can be as awful as they like because the only way to get back at them is to reveal their secret to Dale and nobody in the neighborhood can do that because it is the nuclear option. Once that bomb is dropped, everybody is implicated in the lie, and the fallout will wipe everybody out. Happy birthday, baby. Happy birthday, baby. Nice work, John Redcorn. She didn't suspect a thing. You are so clueless. <laughs> so yes, at this point in our escalation, Hank has passed through the beaded veil and is now transformed in the eyes of his friends and family. June 23rd, I played Boglet Nancy's and left you home. Alone. Some may groan at how quickly Peggy judges Hank and thinks that he's hiding something from her, but I just can't help but smile at how she builds this whole crazy narrative in her mind about Hank's supposed, oh, his secret shame. Now, I just have one question. Did you rent the tape? No! All right, then. But whether you did or you didn't, I still oh. think we should just play. Every time I talk to my sister about this episode, she will roll her eyes at Peggy's shenanigans and say like, Oh, Peggy, you're married to the most non-sexual guy ever. How could you think he would do that? To which I will always reply, in a manner that I like to call cheerfully helpful, that you never truly know the depths of someone's personal life and that we all, all have our secrets. I'm glad I'm not the only one who is disgusted by pornography. It's offensive. It's demeaning. It creates a standard of idealized beauty that your average man can't compete with. And now, if you'll allow me a moment to share a secret of my own, one that does relate to the subject at hand, I want to tell you all something that I have never shared with anyone. If you're a person of a certain age, you may remember Comcast On Demand, which was sort of a streaming service before streaming services existed. On Demand is where I watched a lot of Adult Swim and Toonami shows, mostly King of the Hill, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, and Space Ghost Coast to Coast. But if you were a teen with too much time and testosterone on your hands, there was a very special section buried deep in those menus. A place where, yes, I will admit it, I watched something rather scandalous. Oh, not pornography, no, no, no. Not like our degenerate friend Mr. Hill over here. It was, uh, a lot worse. It was, in fact, old school burlesque shows, pasties and all. Don't ask me why that shit was on there, but it was. And for a repressed teen, those 1920s softcore performances were indeed a godsend, and I'm ashamed to say they've affected me to this very day. So there, I've bared a secret that's been rotting in the pit of my soul for 15 years. My punishment is both this confession here, and back in the day, I stumbled across the 1972 version of Last House on the Left when I was like 15, which really ruined On Demand for me for a while. That movie is just wow. The opposite of sexy. Holy shit. I told you this embarrassing story because I want us all to acknowledge that we all have our own secret shames, and while Hank's situation is certainly extreme and very public, I wouldn't judge him too harshly even if he did rent that movie. But as Dale is quick to point out, Hank's intent on whether he meant to rent the pornography or not is sort of a moot point right now because the computer already has his name and information. By now, your name and particulars have been fed into every laptop, desktop, mainframe, and supermarket scanner that collectively make up the global information conspiracy otherwise known as the Beast. It is so fascinating to see how Dale is essentially laying out how the internet algorithms of today work. Any sort of interaction with a product, even accidental or unintended interactions, will indeed flag you for similar products to get shoved in your face. 
It's the same sort of thing that Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty warned us about. I hear it's amazing when the famous purple stuffed worm in Flapjaw space with the tuning fork does a raw blink on Harry Carey Rock. I need scissors. 61. Find the gap. It's crazy how certain insightful minds saw the harmful potential for the internet and AI and essentially just predicted events that are happening now 20 plus years into the future. Of course, because these were the heady days before everyone had a computer in their house, the beast had to resort to more analog means of reaching out. Who is this? You know, Matt! From Consenting Adults, the country's largest supplier of mail-order adult entertainment. How did you get this number? Not important. Can I just take a moment to say what a good company name Consenting Adults is for a porn distributor? Those are the two most important words in any pornography situation, so it is great that they put that information front and center. But because this is an interstate phone line that he's talking on, and because all of Hank's coworkers are listening to his conversation, Hank pretends that he's speaking to a radio station, and I am pretty sure because he says a number, the guy at Consenting Adults believes that's how many tapes or products Hank is ordering. Arlen Video told you I rent pornography? Uh, uh <laughs> who plays the most hits? Y104. 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 And in a beautiful sequence full of dread, the mountain of porn and porn accessories is shipped to the Hill House, leading to this vicious takedown by Bill, and best of all, Hank is so flabbergasted by the situation that he is left speechless. Shame on you, Hank Hill. What you do in the privacy of your own home is disgusting enough, but to let it spill out into our streets where my future children will someday play? Well, that is going too far. Bless you. Bless you, Bill. This is by far the funniest bit you've had so far in the show. Well, okay, except for maybe this. Shut up, you whitey! Still, though, a great bit, as is this little gem from Peggy. I would like the luxury of vomiting on myself right now, but I don't have any clean clothes to change into. Would you just pay the bill so I can get a new dryer? Good, good show. Keep reminding us of the dryer. Keep that goal in sight. But as Hank goes to return some videotapes, he is confronted by a character that is voiced by Luann's voice actress and one that is voiced by Bobby's too. You need to call the company you bought your pornography from. I don't buy pornography, Luann. Don't you want to prolong your love making <gasps> pleasure for just pennies a night, Mr. Hank? Give me that, Bobby. I love when shows allow their voice actors to really flex their skills and do little bit parts like this. I really wish more actors would be allowed to do this sort of thing, just so every side character in the animated world isn't voiced by Tom Kenny, Tara Strong, or D. Bradley Baker. In any case, Hank makes an impassioned plea for sanity from the people around him, one that falls on deaf ears. Do you know this guy? No dadgum way, man. It's just some dirty old man hanging around with sex toys. Back in my place, if you're interested. I get such a kick out of Hank saying that Bill brings nothing to this fight, but implies that Boomhauer somehow does. Really is playing with a joke that we know next to nothing about Boomhauer or his skills. I also love this ominous warning from Dale. One by one, your friends will desert you. I'll be next. At least he's acknowledging his own toxic tendencies, because this will be the third episode in a row where Dale ditches his supposed friends in a crisis situation. You gotta give me a hand, Dale. Dale, Dale, wait! Uh-oh, Bobby's in trouble. Damn it, it's the Vice Squad. They must have followed us. Quick, Dale, bury the... Dale? I should also mention that this is the very first time that Dale brings up his alter ego, a certain Mr. Shackelford. Who's not a quitter? My dead friend Hank Hill? Or my new friend Rusty Shackelford? It's also notable that he isn't using the name for himself, but rather is offering it to Hank, which you wouldn't think he'd be willing to do. And even better, when Hank is confronted at the dump by yet another Billy West character, Hank hints at his willingness to use the offered pseudonym. All right, give me your license. I'm going to run you through the computer. But I can tell you that I was born in 1953. As a child, I was quite ill. <laughs> But before we leave the dump, uh, I just want to point out really quick how the show is surprisingly willing to show off some of the sexy products that Hank is handling. Same with the batteries in your vibrator. This is not my... and it's not a... it's a wand massager. It says so right on the box. 
And as I'm sure many of you ladies and some of the more adventurous fellas out there can attest to, it is always nice when batteries come included. And boy, that lubricating foam is really doing the job, sending our Vice Squad fella slipping and sliding everywhere as if it's a puddin' pop at Bill Cosby's house. Ooh, ha, ah, you know what? Should I include that joke? Is that in bad taste? Uh, you know what? Maybe. Maybe it is. It depends on the flavor of pudding pop we're talking about. I ran out of air. <sighs> In any case, Hank is tired of slinging butt plugs into sinkholes and decides to take Arlen Video to small claims court. And best of all, Hank's dirty clothes not only reflect the dire state of his mental landscape, but it makes sense when you consider that the man can't clean his clothes. It's brilliant, brilliant really, it rhymes like poetry. And does Peggy stand by her man in his moment of judgment? Well, <laughs> what do you think? What do I have to do to get through to you? Do I have to take off my shirt and dance like the women in your movies? I don't rent those movies! Look at Hank's face during this. <laughs> Brother be Smeckledorf by Peggy's hip swaying, and can I say, can you really blame him? As Captain Kirk once said to his favorite doctor, she's uh, a handsome woman bones. Unfortunately, even the handsomest of women have their limits, and Hank's war against Arlen Video is pegs, leaving Hank without any support and reducing him to this sorry state. Oh man, his trial is tomorrow and he's going in there with nothing but six honks and one signature. And that's on his leg. Darn taggers. So wait a second, somebody tagged Hank's leg with like spray paint? <laughs> How weird. Perhaps we could get the puffin' stuffs and the wind to take care of all that divisive graffiti. But just as everything looks hopeless and Hank has nothing to back him up, a certain mysterious stranger approaches the Hill House and leaves him a very special clue. And hey, looky here, neat little detail, Bobby thinks that all of the movies are more police-style films, which makes sense because all of them seemingly have something to do in their titles with law enforcement. Jailbait? Hung jury? How dare you try to expose my son to these, uh, police tapes that are so degrading to, uh, law enforcement officials. Remember all of you consenting adults, if you're gonna be a freak, a super freak, you're super freaking now, then try to stick with a consistent theme. Of all the titles, I think that Hung Jury is the best. It's like a triple entendre, which is great. But even better, these funky tapes come with an ominously helpful letter. I believe you, Hank. The answer is in the tapes. A friend. Hmm. I need these back when you're done. A friend. Now, I'll address the mysterious tape owner later and a rather weird factor about that, but for right now, I want to talk about how deliciously dreadful this scenario is. This is the peak of our escalation, where Hank has to trust the letter left by his Virgil and act as Dante heading into the first circle of hell. And let's all remember, Dante made lust the first circle of hell because he considered lust the least offensive sin. And why? Because in his mind it was the closest thing to love of all of the main evil deeds. Which means yes, I will be going to hell for my impure thoughts about Street Fighter VI's Manon and her forbidden eldritch grippers, but I will gladly sit atop that whirlwind for I am the storm that is approaching, provoking, and Dante understands my plight, no doubt, because that overly romantic Florentine fucker is gonna be in there with me. Um, but yes, masterfully creative Italians aside, let's look at how Hank is prepping himself to watch the videos in the den, the den that Luann very much still lives in. She even has this really sad family picture, one where she's taped her face onto it as if she's part of the family. Well, sorry, baby, but this ain't season one no more, and you ain't part of no Hill family. Now you're just a sad little woman with her little manger babies and big old tatas that mopes around the house. Oh no, you're not getting a movie, Bobby. <laughs> you are so smooth. But yes, much like the dad from Sinister, Hank watches a series of increasingly distressing tapes, although these ones presumably lack a very certain lawnmower. They do have some rather inappropriate sound effects going on in the background, which kind of makes me think this whole thing is being filmed at the Playboy Mansion hosted by Pee Wee Herman, which, by the way, is a perfect porn name. Here, let me hold that. Thanks, officer. Say, are you a mounted police? Not yet. 
but a girl can dream. And of course, almost predictably, the inevitable happens and Peggy walks in at the worst possible time, right when Hank is trying to get ink out of his pen's narrow ink chamber. Uh, what kind of cop are you? <sighs> a bad one. <gasps> Bobby, for the love of God, get out of the house! Okay. Oh, Peggy, did you learn nothing from Bobby's mishap with the plastic head? In this house, you knock, goddammit! Now, what's confusing about this scene, though, is that Hank is shown locking a door, but it's the front door, which is a very weird kind of mislead. I always thought that he locked the den door, and Peggy just sort of brute-forced her way in, but nope. You can really tell that Hank has never watched porn before because he lacks any sort of true awareness of his surroundings and really just doesn't even think that something awkward might happen. <laughs> My goodness. At least he's able to get what he came for and achieve a brief moment of satisfaction. That's it! That's it! <laughs> yeah, that's it! <laughs> Okay, so it's time for the big showdown at the courthouse, and this time we don't have the insane judge from the Crack Bass episode. This lady actually seems quite competent. You allege that you have been the target of systematic harassment at the hands of a major international computer conspiracy known as the Beast. That is correct, Your Honor. Oh. Mr. Hill, why don't you just pay the $40? Honey, you just presided over a case where a dude had to reimburse someone $1.50 and return some sunglasses. I'm not sure you can say that this is too petty for this supposed court. But whatever. In any case, Hank is able to do his big Mr. Smith Goes to Washington meets Perry Mason meets Backdoor Sluts 9 thingy. Now, how does he prove his innocence? Well, buckle up, because this is a little obtuse. 68 minutes into the film, actress Dee Dee Cup bends over to shoe her horse. You can just make out a tattoo on Dee Dee's left buttock that reads, I heart Charlie Sheen. Okay, I have to admit, I actually had to look up if Charlie Sheen, Mr. Tiger Blood himself, was actually still alive. And not only is he still alive, but he's only 58 somehow, and he just turned 58 in September, which is wild. I could have sworn he was about as old as Ozzy Osbourne or some shit. The man looked terrible 10 years ago, for God's sakes, but, you know, there he is, just 58, whatever. I guess life is just wacky, huh? But yes, the crux of Hank's argument is that the porn actress has a tattoo in cuffs and collars, but lacks the same tattoo in the horribly titled Jailbait. A tape which marks veteran porn star Fernanda Valley's return to the adult film industry on the occasion of her 18th birthday. Wait, 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 hold your shoeing horses for a second. So the tape was filmed on her 18th birthday, or <laughs> was it released on her birthday? Because that is a super important distinction. Hank just says that the film marks her return to the industry, which, by the way, is a disturbing enough statement because that means that she definitely filmed some stuff before she was 18, but saying this marks her return could either mean that this was released on her 18th birthday as her big debut, or that filming started on her 18th birthday, which I really hope is the case because if this was released on her 18th birthday, then obviously it means it was filmed before she turned 18, which is really, really bad. This whole situation kind of reminds me of how I once saw kid pornography being sold at Blockbuster, which, which sounds like a crazy statement, but is actually true. And if you don't believe me, well, hold on to your hats because I have a story for you. You see, back then there was a little video game in the days of Girls Gone Wild called The Guy Game, which was less of a game and more of raw footage from a spring break event mixed in with some half-assed quiz components where if you answered something right, you would see girls take their tops off. And while that might sound like the height of cultured entertainment, one of the girls in the tape was actually 17 at the time and nobody knew for years. A uh, quick little editor's note, the guy game was only on shelves for four months before the lawsuit hit and took it all away. There you go, perverts. You're gonna have to try to get into jail a different way. But eventually somebody figured out what was going on and the guy game was recalled and destroyed, but not before countless people had the chance to buy and rent it. And I can distinctly remember seeing the guy game on the shelf at my Blockbusters, man. It was mixed in with the other mature games like Leisure Suit Larry, God of War, and the best game that you can play with one hand, Dead or Alive Beach Volleyball, bleh. But because I had my on-demand burlesque shows, I never felt the desire to rent out that smut, which thank God I didn't because these days, if you possess the guy game, then 
I'm sorry, but you going to jail. Anyway, Hank points out that Fernanda Valley turned 18 two weeks before he supposedly rented cuffs and collars and shows that the other girl's Charlie Sheen tattoo is missing from jailbait, meaning that cuffs and collars was made after he supposedly rented the tape. Is it possible that I walked into Arlen Video on June 23rd and rented a movie that didn't even exist? I think not! Triumphant in victory, Hank gets the ruling that he worked so hard to achieve. <laughs> And let the record show that Mr. Hank Hill really knows his pornography. And just so we can wrap all of this up with a neat little bow, Hank reminds us what this was all for and returns to the Megalomart on the very same day, no less. Approved. The dryer is yours. Crikey, I wish all of my debts could be wiped out that fast. I mean, like, I don't even think the Arlen video guy had time to go to his store and remove the debt, let alone for the info to, like, go all the way to Hank's credit card company and them to then update his credit score. Like, what the fuck? And, of course, we return to the Hill House where Bobby's dream of a happy birthday finally comes true. It's perfect! Yep. This is the best birthday ever! Ah, so, so sweet. And that's the episode! What a thrill! The darkness and silence through the night couldn't put down Hank's ability to eat up our legal system and spit it out. But now wait, there's one last mystery we almost forgot to solve. Who gave Hank the tapes? <laughs> That's right, it was the first friend to supposedly abandon Hank, the one who protested just a little too much and who was probably secretly thrilled that Hank was also into porn. It was, of course, Mr. Fontaine de la Tour d'Autrive himself. It's sad, really. All he wanted was for his clothes to be dry. Yep. Yep. Oh yeah! And what's so weird about Bill's part in this solution is that he must have done some intense investigating into the dates and realized the truth. He knew about the butt tattoo, he knew something was weird about a cop porno movie that also for some reason has a donkey shoeing scene, and he really went out on a limb that Hank would also figure it all out too. But what really fucks me up about this is that Bill very easily could have just left Hank a note saying the answer is in the date of the tapes, and Hank would have immediately seen that the dates were screwy. At first I thought that Bill didn't do this because like, well, you know, they didn't really have internet back then, so how would Hank have checked when the tapes were made? But Hank knows the date of Fernanda Valley's birthday, which he definitely would have had to look up online, and even if he didn't, that is much more difficult information to find than just when were the tapes made. And besides, Hank actually does have access to the internet. Remember that scene at Strickland Propane? Hank can easily look up information online if he needs to. So this essentially means that Bill basically forced Hank to watch porn, but not just watch it, study it, look into it very deeply. He rubbed Hank's nose in it, and gosh, is that such a Bill thing to do? Mm. Bill, for crying out loud. I was listening. And finally, I have one last question for this episode. Where the hell was Khan during all of this? He would have been so perfect to include. Can you imagine what Khan would have to say upon seeing Hank scooping up all those tapes and products from the street? Oh my gosh, that could have been so amazing. Ow! Did you see? Did you see? Eh, but perhaps that's asking for a little too much. This is already an extremely good episode, and there's pretty much nothing that I would seriously suggest changing about it. And oh sure, we could say, oh, you know, what would Khan think? What would Cotton think? Ugh. But shoehorning in those characters would have meant that we'd have to cut other stuff out. And I really don't want to do that. This thing is already masterfully paced, has a great escalating structure, and is about a subject that some shows might be too afraid to touch on, and I will always, always give bonus points for boldness. Everything has been foretold in the book of Revelations. Uh, you just stepped in a diaper. And speaking of bold, the next episode is a cotton-focused story, one of his best and most unhinged. Which is a little bit like saying a swamp ape with a railgun is a little dangerous. But you know, I don't think I'll be able to review it on my own, there's just so much to talk about, so I'll be having a special guest on the channel to help me shoulder the great weight of that great episode. Someday Governor Reagan will run for president! Oh, 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 oh. But that's for next time. For now, we can say that this episode, titled Hank's Dirty Laundry, has indeed been... 
reviewed to death. And I'll leave you with the episode's ultimate cherry on top, a porno soundtrack adaptation of the main King of the Hill theme. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next review. Start going.